Hi, welcome back. We're going to talk about deconstruction. I'm going to blow your mind or not. We'll see. I will say this. First off, people use the term deconstruct a lot these days to just mean interpret or analyze. And, and that's generally speaking, if that's how people are using it, that's what it means. But in literary studies, in English departments, in your English class and in the university, deconstruction and deconstruct does not just mean interpret. It has a more special, specific meaning that is related to the philosophy of this handsome gentleman here, Jacques Derrida, and, and, his, and the concepts that he developed in the wake of the ideas from structuralism that we explored in the last video. I'm Dr. Jonathan Newman. Uh, this is Lectures in Literary Theory, and today we're talking about deconstruction. Um, and we're, we're talking about, you know, and I don't think there's any one uh, literary theory as strongly identified with one person as um, deconstruction is with Derrida. Not even psychoanalysis with Freud, because there are other psychoanalytical thinkers besides Freud who are have come to be... Um, almost as influential. But Derrida is deconstruction in a lot of ways, and especially in English departments and in the study of literature, this book here of grammatology is kind of the master text. Um, so in this video, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about deconstruction, where it falls in the history of criticism, it's it, it, where what it owes to structuralism and how it comes out of structuralism. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some Derridian concepts, that is, uh, concepts of Derrida. Uh, in philosophy, and we're going to try not to spend too much time on that because I'm not a philosopher and I'm not fundamentally interested in philosophy and the kind of arguments that philosophy does. So, we're, But we're going to introduce that enough so that we can talk about how deconstruction came to be used widely in literary study. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the influences and legacies of deconstruction and how, even though, again, in the 2020s, there aren't many literary critics and English professors today who would say, I am a deconstructionist. Um, it has kind of pervaded the discipline and practices of a lot of other critical approaches. Um, so, we're, so we'll talk a little bit about its leg legacy. All right. So who is Jacques Derrida? He was, he just died in like 2005 or something like that. I should put, I should put his dates up here, but you can Google him. He was an Algerian French philosopher. Uh, he was the author of many books, including of grammatology, writing and difference and speech and phenomena. He follows out the implications of structuralism. That is to say, he's like, okay, if, if structuralism is how meaning is organized, what does that mean for meaning? Um, he, one of the things about Derrida that he's famous for is that his writing is difficult. It's elusive. It is not straightforward. It is full of puns and other kinds of wordplay. And the point of this isn't just to be cute and clever, but in, in to way, in, but he's trying to illustrate and perform his own arguments. But, um, but in a way, he's also undermining his own arguments, which, as we will see, is in keeping with the entire spirit of deconstruction. Now, in previous videos, we have talked about the relationship um, between the text, the encoder, um, the reader, uh, and the world in meaning, um, and, and how different approaches to literature will search for where we find the meaning in different places and in different relationships in this. So we can ask, where does deconstruction find meaning um, in this arrangement? Uh, the, the answer is that um, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, Hera 404, meaning not found. Um, deconstruction is very often about the failure of meaning or the deferral of meaning and the way that uh, texts frustrate our search for a definitive meaning. How do we get there then? Um, well, let's talk about deconstruction and philosophy. Um, it, pictured here is the benevolent god Thoth from ancient Egyptian mythology who taught human beings writing. Um, and the reason he's pictured here is because Thoth is brought up by uh, the Socrates in the Dialogues of Plato, where he talks about why speech is better than writing and where writing is deficient and a failure. And as we will see, um, 
uh, Derrida will, will do a lot with this um, debate over what's better, speech or writing. But first, before we get into Derrida and his post-structuralism, let's just briefly review the ideas of structuralism from the last video. As we remember, one of the determinative findings of structuralism is that meaning works through difference. Signification is differential. So we know what a tree is, not just because it corresponds to some kind of universal concept of a tree in our head, but because it is different from a shrub and it is different than a tree. And so these three signifiers among themselves, these three signs, form a structure of meaning that uh, arranges a number of different kinds of plants. But one thing that these things have in common um, and which they and which is which and that commonality is based on an exclusion is the fact that they are whole. They are entire plants. They are not parts of plants, for example. Tree shrubs and plants all have bark but are not bark. They all have leaves but are not leaves. They all may have fruit or seeds of some kind, but they are not fruits or fruit or seeds. So these items belong more widely to this chain of signification, but within this narrower uh, path that we track through meaning, we exclude these other things in order to make a kind of a coherent uh, system of meaning out of types of plants, types of entire plants. But some of these signifiers also exclude other things, other associations. For example, when we talk about a tree, and we're thinking about the plant that grows outside and has leaves and barks and fruit, we are excluding tree in some of its other usages. Like for example, it's metaphor extension to this device, the hat tree on which we put hats and coats, right? And, you know, and even here, there's a kind of iconic resemblance between these two or where we can motivate it. But the word bark just has a purely phonetic association with, this, with bark as the sound that a dog makes. Now, what does all this mean? It means that um, every signifier includes that which it suppresses. And every suppressed meaning, every meaning that is not part of the official meaning, that is subordinated, that is sort of put away in order to find a determined meaning. So that when I think about a fruit and I think about an apple, I'm suppressing the banana but the banana is always there. It is always already there as what Derrida calls the trace. And meaning is impossible, according to Derrida, without the trace. The trace is the absent presence of all signifiers excluded from the structure. We use language to divide up reality, but in the, tr in the cracks between the stations on that on those train lines that we use to chart, to map our reality and get around it are all the things that we don't uh, give ourselves access to, but which are there, which we are going through. Um, and so that absent presence is excluded from the structure, but the structure is impossible without it. And so absence is part of the structure. And so the structure itself cannot stand in for presence. What do I mean by presence here? I mean the availability of a stable, reliable, accessible meaning. So that stability of meaning, whenever we want to grasp it, is always being pushed along by the trace. When I say the bark of a tree, that uh, there's always the destabilizing presence of the bark of a dog that's in there. And so meaning is always is established by difference, but also, um, and here is where uh, Derrida is making one of his famous puns, it's also established by différence, right? And these are pronounced the same in French, différence, différence. To differ is also to defer, like, you know, like you defer paying your tuition or your student loans, it means to put it off, right? To kind of scoot down the line, to kick, to kick it down the field. And so meaning, is always kind of kicked down the field. It's, it's always kind of just escaping our grasp. It's always like if you try to pin down the meaning, you always have to go to another signifier, which takes you to another signifier. Um, you can see this in the other video that I 
uh, linked this week and which um, I will link actually because it's really useful for understanding deconstruction. It was made by another creator. I um, mean, I will put it in the, uh, the notes to this video. Um, so, uh, therefore, um, the system of meaning that works through binary opposition, through saying, you know, a fruit is not a seed a, and a banana is not an apple, that system of binary opposition um, that we build meaning out of uh, has some problems. It has some loopholes. And Derrida explores that problem um, primarily in his in of grammatology and some of his famous early works from the 1960s by talking about the difference and the opposition between speech and writing. Pictured here are two legendary talkers. On the left, Jesus doing the Sermon on the Mount. On the right, Socrates. I don't know what he's doing. He's just talking. Um, and both of them are considered, you know, great teachers in the tradition, right? Whether whether or not you believe he's the son of God or not, he's, he's you know, one of the great wisdom teachers of the Western tradition. And he is, of course, in the Christian tradition associated with logos, with the word itself, with reason, with rationality, with the principle of order behind creation. Um, speech is privileged over writing. Uh, in both cases, we have um, the original teachers who never write, they only talk, and their writings will later be uh, written down by the apostles, by Plato and others. Um, and there's an association thus of speech with presence, right? Um, uh, speech is um, linked to the presence of the speaker, and the presence of the speaker is linked to intention. And we understand stability of meaning and the authenticity of meaning as being linked to the intention of the speaker. And I see this in my students all the time when they when they write, you know, about Shakespeare, what what Shakespeare means or what Emily Dickinson means or what they intend. Right. That there is somehow that uh, link of meaning with intention that is part of just the, the, the faith that we bring to language that intention gives us secure knowledge. Well, what do you mean by that? And if you know what you mean by that, what you intend by that, then I know the meaning of what you're trying to say. And so presence, the presence of the speaker, the presence of the consciousness to language itself is privileged over absence. And absence is linked to writing, as in this writing on a gravestone here. Um, absence is the realm of otherness, of death, of lack. Writing is seen as a deficiency, as a failure, as as something that you need to um, get through in order to get at that original intention, right? Writing is a problem to solve. Writing is a fallen order. It is not just a, a signifier like language is, but it is in fact the signifier of a signifier. It is at like a second hand removed from reality. Um, Derrida identified this privileging of speech over writing as logocentrism. Logocentrism is the link of presence and all that it entails that we've just discussed to the spoken word. Deconstruction is a critique of logocentrism. It argues that this, and this is where it gets really complicated, so, so, so feel free to like play this on point 75 speed or just, you know, follow along as best you can and think about it. Deconstruction argues that the self that is constituted through entry into communication is not a reliable presence. That is to say that language always works in the realm of signification, of the trace, of suppression, of absence. There is no meaning without absence. Um, and that the, our self-representation and our self-understanding in language is always embedded in that um, those acts of exclusion, of loss, of slip, of slippage, right? The, 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 the free play of the signifier, and thus our privileging of speech over writing is based on the impossible identification of the speaking voice with presence, with intention. That this is an act of hope. It's an act, perhaps, of faith, and I don't think uh, some Christians, of course, would would deny that. Um, 
that that you know I the the I, the, the the word is stable, and I understand the meaning of the word just because I believe in it. Um, but but deconstruction says well. If it's an act of faith, then it is. Oh, there's ultimately this gap that you have to overcome, that that meaning is inaccessible in its own terms. You cannot get there through language. You can't get there through the structure of signification. It is that meaning, that secure, stable meaning that will guarantee our sure knowledge of intention, meaning, presence. It is, as Derrida called it, the transcendental signified. It is the signified that exists outside the order of signification that is the structure of language. It lays outside the structure of differential meaning. There is no point on that node, on that network of, of binary oppositions of tree, bark, you know, shrub, fruit. There's no one point in that network of, of signs that secures the meaning of all the rest. The transcendental signified can't be, can't be accessed through language, but nevertheless serves to stabilize and secure the possibility of meaning itself. And for Derrida, the, the, the privileging of speech over writing in the philosophical tradition and the religious tradition from Jesus and Plato all the way through Rousseau um, uh, is logocentrism. It's that it's that that yearning for that stable, self-authorizing meaning. Um, now, through time, that transcendental signified was originally, we could say, understood as God in 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 our tradition. Um, but in in terms of humanism, that as it developed in the the Renaissance, for example, and and uh, uh, other kinds of humanism, man becomes, quote unquote, the measure of all things. And so the transcendental signified, the stable term uh, or the term through which we, we Im imply this kind of plurality, this overabundance of meaning that stabilizes everything else um, becomes man. Man is the measure of all things, right? That's Renaissance humanism. But then in the Enlightenment, the transcendental signified shifts to reason. It's reason itself that provides the authority through which we can have certain knowledge of meaning about the world. Reason, however, fails, and the Romantics bring in nature as the, as the ultimate guarantor of the stability of meaning, um, and this survives for a lot of people. I, all of these survive for, like, none of these have gone away. Um, all of these continue to serve as transcendental signifieds. They have just uh, built around each other like tree rings. Um, and finally, for structuralists and for those who, like Levi Strauss and not not so much Bart, but uh, for for structuralists, the language itself or the structure of meaning came to serve as the transcendental signified. The idea of the totality of all possible meaning serving as the 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 ground for the possibility of meaning to happen in the first place. But as Derrida argues, if you can't ever have a stable center to that meaning if it's always um, deferred, if the, if the trace is always there upsetting the, the, the simple correspondence of sign to signifier, then, the, then this, this language itself, the structure cannot serve as the idea of the stabilizing uh, transcendental signified that keeps meaning um, working. Thus, <laughs> There, and the way he puts this is that uh, there is no outside the text. Il n'y a pas de hors text. Um, we cannot find and verify intentions beneath words. There is no prior to language. Therefore, writing is the condition of all language, and speech is the derived or secondary concept. So what Derrida has done here is he's taken a very traditional um, binary hierarchy, speech over writing, and he has seen how speech depends on writing uh, in, in, or, in order for it to have meaning. It's defined by not being writing, but at the same time, the condition of speech, the unavailability of the presence of the speaker, is actually the condition of writing. So he's, he's sort of inverted that hierarchy and, um, and made writing the primary condition of meaning. This work of destabilizing hierarchies is basically the work of deconstruction. And deconstruction, according to hardcore deconstructionists, people who are really into Derrida, this is not something you do. 
to language. It's something that is already there and that you find in language. Um, uh, the, the, the hierarchies destabilize themselves. You just kind of follow the, the, the path through which that happens when you're doing deconstructive writing or work. So the subordinate term is actually a condition for the privileged term. Speech is dependent on writing. Presence requires absence. Um, later on in his ethical work, uh, Derrida talked about friendship and how it's predicated on enmity. That is the idea of there being enemies. Um, and so any solid reliable term that you're using as, as a kind of keyword for understanding reality is always slippery. It's always in one way that, that this slipperiness, this semantic impossibility is indicated is through the idea of erasure. And so deconstructions, you'll see them putting a line through things. And this really, this kind of um, hardcore deconstruction, this really peaked in the 1980s, um, I think, and it, it kind of faded after that. Uh, but, but a lot of the deconstructionist ideas have continued to serve literary uh, critics. The idea that there is no conceptual stability to binary oppositions creates a lot of opportunity for rethinking how we approach the meaning of culture and texts. Going back to the slide from our structuralist presentation, um, we can think about all of these binary oppositions that we build culture out of straight, gay, white, black, father, son, male, female, normal, deviant, center, and margins. If you've ever heard the term marginalized, right, there's a sense in which that use of marginalized peoples comes out of this deconstructive way of thinking and the structuralist way of thinking. Um, so, how then has this served literary criticism? Well, some of the implications of deconstruction for the post-structuralist study of literary culture is what we're gonna talk about now. And I'm just bringing in our guy Foucault here. Um, we're not talking about him in this too much in this video, although he does kind of relate to, well, we'll get to him in a second. So, all right, to review the, the big implications of deconstruction, there is no transcendental signified, or if there is, it is not represent representable, it's not reliable. Although relationships among signs account for contextual meanings, those, like I know um, that bark, if I'm talking about botany, is referring to the, 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 the surface of the stemmy core of the plant, and not to a dog barking, those relationships those relationships are never fixed or fully knowable. Texts betray traces of their own instability. There is nothing outside the text. And this is another way of stating the idea of the death of the author, right? Um, uh, and the deployment of power, therefore, um, uh, in binary oppositions, master, slave, father, son, ruler, ruled, is polyvalent, it goes two ways. And this is what Foucault does with deconstructive and post-structuralist ideas. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this too long now, um, but power is generative and oppressive, right? Power is what creates the, the conditions for cultural production in the first place. But, and power is never unilateral. And the re-empowerment of victims is possible as well. This is one of the other sort of implications um, uh, as to why deconstruction isn't just a philosophical game about meaning, but why it matters for people who live in the world and have to negotiate the world. So uh, in this slide, I'm going to talk about how we do deconstruction then. What does it mean for a literary critic? I'm a university press professor like Paul DeMann uh, at Yale in the 1980s, and I'm going to deconstruct this text. I'm, I'm Marshall Lester, I'm going to deconstruct, it's 1987, and I'm going to deconstruct the Canterbury Tales. What does that mean? Well, here's how deconstruction was done as a method. And, and of course, hardcore deconstructionists will say that, that if you turn it into a method, you've basically misunderstood it, but that didn't stop people. So, I'm going to deconstruct this text, I'm going to explain the text in a way that sets up its structure, and then I'm going to expose the instability of that structure. I'm going to identify tensions. I'm going to identify unities that resolve those tensions and point out how elements and tension are really not in opposition. So for instance, in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I might talk about the binary opposition between the signifier that is the pentagram 
that represents the chivalric values of Gawain, including you know masculinity and loyalty and friendship and courage and and all those like knightly things, versus the girdle that he rep that he accepts from Lady Bertilac, and that girdle represents a kind of flat, um, it can represent a lot of things, right? It doesn't really say what it represents. The, pe the pentagram says, I will tell you what I represent. Here is a list of five meanings that I have and five meanings that are sub meanings of all those things. Whereas all the pent all the girdle represents is this is going to save your life, right? And so he goes back with this girdle wrapped around him that, that did in fact save his life. Uh, and then all of the other uh, people in the court of Arthur decide, well, that girdle doesn't mean shame. It means honor, right? And so the girdle becomes almost a symbol of the instability of the sign. But the pentagram, but the pentagram itself, the, 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 the five uh, starred, the five pointed star that represented Gawain took him into the bind that he was in in the first place that led him to have to accept the girdle because, you know, the the principles of courtesy by which he should obey the lady, but also fellowship by which he should um, honor the agreement that he makes with Bertilac uh, are contradictory. So the, 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 um, the, st this, the stability of this endless knot that the pentagram represents is in fact unstable. It is already a girdle, right? And so what I've done is to deconstruct the, um, or to, to find how the opposition between girdle and pentagram um, are not actually in opposition to each other, but each depends on the, uh, each other. And the so-called elevated sign, the, the sign that's given prestige by this culture as being perfection is actually radically imperfect in a way that is better signified by the girdle. Uh, um, okay, so what deconstruction enables? What, why do it? Well, it's it's fun. It allows for multiple interpretations. It's kind of punk. It allows the critic to be creative. Um, you can apply deconstruction to all of culture, from great canonical works of uh, works like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight to Marvel movies or commercials or YouTube videos or anything. Well, just like structuralism, it takes everything into account. Um, it also uh, does not assume. It does not. And adopt a kind of rever reverential or worshipful attitude towards art and culture. It, um, unlike the new critic, who's always trying to explain why a work of art works and why everything fits together, uh, the, 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 somebody armed with deconstruction can look at the failures, the imperfections, the limitations of a work of art. And in a way, this is kind of humane because we are imperfect. We are limited. There are limits to our knowledge. And so deconstruction is perhaps more honest about what it's like to live in the world and try to make sense of it. Um, deconstruction also, by holding up binary hierarchies and, say, and saying, well, what, is, what is being excluded here by these categories enables the question of oppressive hierarchies. Um, uh, so critiques of deconstruction, um, it's confusing. <laughs> it's hard to understand. And it's easy to fake. You can make up deconstructive sounding things because it's so slippery in the way that it uses language. Another critique of deconstruction is that if you can't find determinate meaning, what's the point? Why bother looking? You're going to interpret, you're going to spend all this time writing about interpreting this poem just to say that there's no like clear, obvious interpretation. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Some people could argue that it's too fixated on flaw on failure, on instability, on the insecurity of meaning. It's also hard to do well. It makes it easy for the meaning of text to be controlled and reduced by the values and prejudices of the interpreter. I would argue that that's true of all literary criticism, that we're all, um, to some extent, uh, imposing a meaning on a text. I'm, I'm kind of reader response in that way. But I think deconstruction um, is sympathetic to that as well. Um, that there is an act of will involved. And some have seen uh, connections between um, deconstruction and the work of Nietzsche, who sees uh, the, the, the constitution of values and meaning as being an act of will on the part of, of in the interpreter. Um, let's see. Uh, finally, let's just talk a little bit about how deconstruction has influenced other schools of literary criticism. Obviously, all of post-structuralism has 
uh, been influenced by Derrida and Derridian ideas. It has also influenced heavily post-colonial theory. Um, Homi K. Baba here, who talks about hybridity and the hybrid identity and the way that the, the, de de the colonial subject sees himself through the eyes of the other and questions this whole, this whole idea of identities as being built on the free play of signifiers really owes a lot to Derrida. Um, feminist criticism has also made substantial use of, of deconstruction, um, especially in th using techniques of deconstruction to unpack um, binary hierarchies of male and female and masculine and feminine. Judith Butler here, of course, um, was instrumental in moving fem feminism beyond feminism into what we now call gender studies um, and queer theory and, um, has, and asked about how, like, what even in the binary of male and female gets excluded from, from, from that, right? And, and so a lot of just modern discourse on gender uh, which continues to be controversial, uh, comes out of deconstructionist thought. Um, critical race theory and its examination of how um, whiteness and blackness is constructed, for, for example, in the United States of America as categories of exclusion, as slippery categories, as categories that continuously need to be reasserted through acts of power um, is also based on deconstruction. Um, Eve Sedgwick here, also an important pioneer in queer theory and thinking about how um, selves are constructed in language that are marked as gay or straight and how those lines are negotiated. And um, Gayatri Spivak here, of course, is perhaps um, Derrida's greatest acolyte in the English speaking world. She translated his very difficult work from French into English and developed his ideas in reference to both, both uh, post-colonial theory and feminism and um, just the philosophy of language generally. Uh, I hope your brain hasn't exploded. I hope your brain has exploded. Maybe we can deconstruct the binary between exploded and not exploded. In any case, if you don't understand deconstruction after watching this video, that's okay. It's very hard to understand and you can trace my flaws, my failures, and my um, the, the slipperiness of my meanings here. But I've done the best I can to try to convey the flavor of deconstruction. And I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, I would recommend looking at it from a number of different sources. Uh, Jonathan Culler, uh, somebody named Norris uh, wrote on Derrida. Uh, and yeah, and I think if, if you're interested in this, try, try to approach it in the spirit of fun and not frustration. Um, but we're going to be moving on after this from these more kind of theor high, what, from what we what so this is sometimes called high theory to um, a more uh, engaged theory. And, and in, in, in the remainder of these videos, we're going to look at post-colonial theory and feminist criticism and a lot of these things that take a lot of these bigger ideas from psychoanalysis and deconstruction and structuralism and so on and so forth and apply them to relationships of power and practices in the world where people live. So thanks for listening. This is kind of the end of the first half of this series of, of videos. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Bye.